بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد continuing on in our study of the treaties هذه دعوتنا وعقيدتنا بشيخ إمام مقبل بن هادي الوادعي الله يرحمه and just as a brief briefly I just want to summarize what we've covered so far in the treaties and we spoke about the Sheikh Imam Muqbil bin Hadi al Wadi and his service to the Dawah to Ahl Sunnah in Yemen, especially, but in fact worldwide, because he has students all over the world who are still spreading Khair, Alhamdulillah, and that is a Fadl min Allah Azza wa Jal. The Sheikh began his treaties. He spoke about his experience in Najran, in the south of Saudi Arabia and uh, the Shia, the Shiite and the Ismailis that he witnessed there and their creed and then he spoke about some of the important foundation or foundations of the Aqidah and Minhaj of Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'ah things like he began his treaties and we've already spoken about this about uh, you know, believing, of course, in Allah. He began with the first pillar of Iman. This is the pillar of Iman as it came in the Hadith of Jibreel. And to min abillahi wal malaikati wa kutubi wa rasuli wa yawm al wa to min abillahi wa kutubi wa sham. That when the angel Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam and his companions and he asked, What is Islam and what is Iman? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam described Iman and to min abillahi in believing in it's believing in Allah. So that is the first pillar of Iman. And Shaykh Muqbil began his treaties with that important first pillar because Islam is about Tawheed. That's why we can never underestimate the importance of studying Tawheed, resetting Tawheed, continuing on our study of Tawheed and building upon our studies in Tawheed because that is the foundation of Islam. It's all about worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and how to worship Him properly. And so that first pillar of Iman in Tu'min of Billah, and as the Shaykh said, نؤمن بالله وبأسمائه وصفاته that we believe in Allah in His divine names and attributes and we spoke about some of those important قواعد and principles with regards to الأسمائي وصفات that we only describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as in the way that He's described He describes Himself in the Quran or in the authentic sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so His divine names and attributes they are derived, they come from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. But I can't say all of a sudden I'm going to call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give him a new name, and say he is the maker of the books, or something. No, although Allah created everything, it's sufficient to say he is al-Khalid, because this comes with the source, this is backed up from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So we take uh, the divine names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his attributes from the Qur'an and the Sunnah, the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We, we don't... Uh, ask how they are, we don't negate them, we don't distort their meaning, and we don't make tishbi, we don't make a resemblance between Allah and His creation. So, so uh, for example, the Prophet Allah uh, says we have in the Kareem, Ar-Rahman ala ars istawa, the most merciful rose above His throne. So Ahl Sunnah we say yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rose above His throne because He said this about Himself in the Quran. And we don't change the meaning. We don't distort the meaning and we don't negate the meaning. And we don't say it's tashbih. We say he rolls above the throne in a manner that suits his majesty. That's enough for us. The Prophet ﷺ said, Yanzulu Rabbuna Tabarak wa Ta'ala Kunuthunu Thalayl al Akhir. That your Lord descends to the last uh, heaven, to the lowest heaven every last third of the night. We don't say how. We don't say it's uh, such and such time in Saudi Arabia, it's such and such time in Seattle, it's such and such time in Toronto, it's this time in China. So how could he have did this and how? No, we don't say any of that. We stay away from that. But we say Allah does it in a manner that suits His majesty. And we don't make a resemblance between Him and His creation because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the Kitab al Kareem, uh, uh, about, about Himself, the, the very important qaida. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
that there is nothing that resembles him. So Allah negates that there's any resemblance between him and his creation. Then he affirms, but he and he is the all seeing, the all hearing. So Allah, that means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala possesses the characteristics of hearing and seeing. But those characteristics are divine characteristics. They are perfect. And we don't compare them to our hearing and seeing. Although we hear and see. But our hearing and seeing is not like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect. I can hear what's going on in this room. I can't hear what's going on three rooms over. I can't hear what's going on underneath us. I can't hear what's going on on the ceiling. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears everything. I can see who's in this room. I can see what's in this room. Allah sees everything. He sees the and hears the black ant in the deep, dark, uh, deepest depths of the night on a dark rock or under a dark rock. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees it in the middle of the desert. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees everything and hears everything. And so we don't compare his divine attributes to our weak attributes. And then the shaykh mentioned that we don't call upon the dead and we seek refuge in Allah alone. That this is also a part of the Aqidah of Ahl Sunnah. And likewise, that Ahl Sunnah, and this is coming up to the point of the treaties where we are now, that Ahl Sunnah accepts the Nasus, the Quran and the Sunnah, by its apparent meaning first. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ar Rahman, Ar Arsh Istawa, we accept that in its apparent meaning. We don't have to make ta'wil, we don't have to change the meaning. Oh, Istawa means Istola, or Istawa means this. No, we say that it means what it means as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about himself. But it's in a manner that suits his majesty. So we accept the dhahir and the nasus unless there's galil to show us that that text is uh, metaphorical or something like this. And even the ulama of Islam, they debate about there being metaphors in the Quran and the Sunnah. So that's another area of study which is outside the scope of this treaties. Also the shaykh uh, said that we believe that the mu'mineen will see their Lord on the day of judgment and we gave the adilla for that. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi kitab al-kareem, Wujuhu yawmaydin nadira ila rabbiha nadira. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And faces that day will be bright, and they will see their Lord. So that's evidence that who? That the believers, the mu'mineen, will see their Lord on, on the day of judgment. That is a fadl, that's a benefit from Allah. That we believed in Allah all the years of your life that you believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you never saw him subhanahu wa ta'ala but you believe in the unseen we believe that Allah exists we pray five times a day even though we've never seen the one we pray to but we believe in him subhanahu wa ta'ala we believe in the Quran we believe in the sunnah of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we believe that there was a man Muhammad ibn Abdullah the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we believe in him even though we never met him and we try to follow his sunnah even though we weren't there when his sunnah was revealed. Alayhi salatu wasalam. But the believers, they will see, that's a, a benefit, that they will see a, a favor from their Lord. That they will, uh, and that's a point of Aqidah, and you'll find this in all the early, most of the early uh, Aqidah books, you'll find these same Messiah. The Shaykh is just showing that his Aqidah, have he da'atana, have he Aqidatana, that this is our da'wah, this is our Aqidah, that this da'wah, this propagation of Islam, this minhaj, this aqidah, this creed, is the same creed of Ahmad Sunnati wa Jama'ah. It's the same creed that you'll find uh, protected and preserved in the books of the Salaf of this Ummah. He also said when we believe in the Shafa, we believe that the and the uh, the sinners from Ahmad Sunnah uh, and from Ahmad Iman will come out of the hellfire. Those people who were major sin sinners in this life, they were committing adultery, they were drinking wine, they were doing whatever major sin, but they still were a Muslim and died as a Muslim, that eventually they'll be taken out of the fire if they have to spend time in the fire, and may Allah protect us from the hellfire. And then we talked about loving the companions, and that's from the Aqidah of Ahl Sunnah, and we gave the Adilla from the Kitab and the Sunnah, and some of the Athar of the Salaf of this Ummah. And we also said that we dislike those who hate them and those who speak about them, because speaking about them is speaking about the deen. How is it the Orientals, they speak about Abu Huraira? Why do they, have they written books for the past century about Abu Huraira, studying him, speaking ill about him? 
Because if they can cause the Muslims, and especially the weak Muslims, to call call down and say, "Hey, you're right. Abu Huraira had this was this had this mistake. There's no way he could have memorized this. There's no way this this and this." They call you to doubt Abu Huraira. They call you to doubt Islam because how much of Islam is transmitted from Abu Huraira? He's the Mirror Mu'minin and Hadith. He is the leader, the most uh, collector of Hadith. So if you say that he is weak and he's just a weak human being and he forgot and he's this and he's that, then you can now play and say, well, Islam in reality is not uh, from Allah or Islam in reality is uh, full of holes and contradictions. This is how the Orientals, Orientalists attack, uh, attack Ahlul Sunnah and attack Ahlul Iman in fact. And this is also the same way the Rafa that do too, the Rafa the Shia, you know, and the other groups. And some of the seculars, those who have some Shia influence and secularism as well, they also attack Abu Huraira and other uh, uh, and Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhum And we love Ahl al-Bayt as we mentioned. And we love Ahl al-Hadith as we also mentioned, that Ahl al-Hadith is the Prophet said, Ba tazal ta'ifatu min ummati da'ili al haq the Prophet said, there won't cease to be a group from my nation that's on the truth, even if the people differ with them. In another narration, even if the people differ with them, even if the people, uh, you know, differ or criticize them, that they'll still be on the truth until the Day of Judgment. Meaning, Ahmad Sunni will always be present. There's always going to be a, a small group out there who are adhering to the truth. And the great imams of explainers of hadith, like Imam Nawi and Imam Bukhari and Imam Ahmad, they all explain that Ahl hadith, that it refers to Ahl hadith. Uh, Imam Nawi said it refers to the Mujahideen and uh, anyone who is from the righteous, the best of the Muslims from the Fuqaha, the Mujahideen, the, the, the Muhaddithin. So also he referred to as Ahl hadith as well. Uh, and that those who have, uh, who are known for their worship and their piety and leaving off the dunya and those who commanded the good, that all of them fall under that. And those do not, uh, those uh, two definitions do not contradict one another, they strengthen one another, that all of that makes up uh, the taifa, taifa to mansura, the, the saved sect, because they are the ones who are saved from the fire as a, as a sect, so to speak. Because the Prophet وسلم, said in another hadith, uh, he said, after explaining that the Jews and Christians would break into 71 sects and 72 sects, my ummah and 73 sects, all of them in the fire except one. And they said, Who are they, Ya Rasulullah? Those people who are upon I, what I'm upon and my, my companions are upon. They are also, this is Ahl Sunnah. This makes up who Ahl Sunnah. Uh, is and so then we reach the part portion of the treaties coming up to date where the uh, the sheikh said نقره علم الكلام ونرى أنه من أعظم الأسباب لتفرق الأمة the sheikh said رحمتullahi he said and we hate the people of kalam أهل kalam and we believe that they are the the greatest reason for the dividing divisions in the Ummah. They're the reasons that the Ummah is broken up into sect sectarianism. They're one of the greatest reasons. And so, Alma Kalam uh, is in reference to uh, what he, he's referring to here is affirming your Aqidah by your intellect instead of looking at the Nasus of the Quran and the Sunnah. So uh, what, what this refers to, al Kalam, is referring to those people, those sects, and from amongst them is uh, many like the Mu'tazila, the Ashaira, the Jahamiya before them, the many, many groups of al Kalam that basically they're minhaj. This is a minhaj and a method. Is that they believe that your intellect first in deducing ahkam and understanding the ahkam over the Quran and the Sunnah. Quran and Sunnah has to be understood in accordance with what they believe is the correct intellect, more or less. 
That's how they affirm their Aqidah. But Ahl Sunnah says, no, we go to Quran and the Sunnah, and that's, we make our intellect in accordance with that. Because the Nasus leads us. So that's the difference in the, the Medha, in the understanding of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine uh, attributes, for example. We say, you know, Ar-Rahman ar Allah says that, so we say that. And we don't take our intellect and say, well, it probably means this, because that might mean, that might make a resemblance between Allah and His creation, or blah, blah, blah. No, we don't use the intellect for that. Instead, our intellect, we make it conform to the Qur'an and the Sunnah, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that's Tislim bin Nasus. That's the Aqeedah of Ahl Sunnah. But the Mutakallimeen, they, especially with regard to the Nasus of the Sifat of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, they use their intellect. And the Salaf of this Ummah, they spoke very harshly about Ahl Kalam, which is amazing that still people would uh, make ta'deen of that madhab, you know, and, and still believe it's a great madhab. But there are so many books, as Sheikh Mukbali says, وَكَدْ أَلَّفَ السَّلَفْ أَشَرَاتِ الْكُتُبِ فِي ذِمْ عِلْمَ كَلَامِ مِنْهَا ذِمْ كَلَامِ لِلْحَرُوِي Haru, Harui, or something like this. It's a very famous a book from the Salaf, uh, uh, one of the Salaf, and his book called Dhim Kalam Wa Ahlihi. So the Sheikh said, and the Salaf, they wrote many, you know, tons of books, maybe, you know, tens of books about showing the dis unpraiseworthiness of Kalam, of this methodology of using your intellect uh, over the, the text of the Qur'an and the Sunnah and taking preference to your intellect before the Qur'an and Sunnah and even in, its, in your understanding of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So this is the, uh, that's the madhab of Ahl Kalam. And we'll end with a beautiful ethar. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala said, Inna Allah subhanahu qad akmal deen fala yahtaj deenana إلى فلاسفة يونانية ولا إلى أراء أراء المعتزلة ولا إلى ترهات الصوفية ولا إلى سخافات الشيعية فقال سبحانه اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورديت لكم إسلام الدين. This was actually the statement of Sheikh Mukbil رحمة الله عليه. He said, "Verily Allah, the Almighty." has perfected uh, our religion. So we don't need in our religion, we don't need philosophy, we don't need Greek philosophy, we don't need uh, the opinions of the Mu'tazila uh, about understanding the religion, we don't need the uh, way of the Sufiya and their understanding of the Nasus and their Ta'wilat, their Ta'wilat Ba'atila, nor do we need that which the Shia have brought as far as innovation. But instead, we go with the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he says, This day I perfected uh, for you your religion and I completed my favor upon you uh, and, I, and I am pleased for you. Islam is your religion. So that lets us know the perfection of Islam that we don't need bid'ah. We don't need new innovations. We don't need new understandings of the text. We don't need new qawah and, and principles. <coughs> We only need that which comes from the dalil of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. That does not negate the fact that we, with regards to fiqh, that we have new issues and new nawazil, that we have to understand fiqh and nawazil, and new messiah that we need the ulama to study and give us uh, rulings on, because like technology is ever-changing, things like this. That does not negate that fact, nor does that contradict that. But we're talking about, with regards to Ahl Kalam, we're talking about issues primarily, our differences is with regards to Aqidah, which is the foundation of the deen. So that we don't need to now reinterpret the Qur'an or to, and, and depart from the way the Salaf understood the Qur'an or depart from the way the Salaf understood the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and depart from their Minhaj and their Aqidah and Dawah and the other aspects of the religion. But in fact, we, Ahl Sunnah, adheres to Kitabi Allah Sunnah Rasul according to the Madhab of the Salaf. And here are some Athar, 
uh, and some hadith from the Prophet ﷺ also speaking about those people who like to debate and argue. The Prophet ﷺ said, Abghudu rijal al-Allahi al-Laddul Khisam al-Khasam That the most hated men to Allah, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the one who is uh, excessive in argumentation and, and debating. Also, Imam Tirmidhi uh, collected a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where the Prophet Sallallahu said, مَا ذَلَّقُونَ بَعْدَ الْهُدَى كَانُوا عَلَيْهِ إِلَّا أُوتُ الْجَدَمْ That a people were, did not become misguided after uh, guidance except when they were given uh, debating or argumentation, meaning arguing over the haq. The haq is clear, but yet they want to debate and argue over it. So this is a very dangerous thing uh, and to be cautious of excessive debate. And many of the self, even some statements where some of the self said, I believe it's a, a, a narration on Imam Malik or it was Imam Shafi'i, rahimahumullah jami'in, where he was referring to the person who loves to debate, he said this person is the most fickle in their religion because one day they hold this opinion, next day they hold this opinion. And they, whenever they lose a debate, then they just go with the, uh, the, the next person's view. So they're constantly changing. One day he's a Sufi, next day he's a Tekfiri, next, third day he's this, he's a Khawad, the fourth day, he's joined a Khawad Muslimin the fifth day, he's with this group the next day, he's extreme Sufi the next day, he worships graves the next day, all of this, why? Because they're not grounded in their deen, and they argue and debate and get involved in issues they shouldn't, and this will make the person that when they get into debates, that it depends on who has the best argumentative skills. It's not the hawk that rules the debate, but it has to do with who's better at arguing. So if this person has more charisma and they're a better debater, perhaps they're going to convince you to where you change your minhaj, you change your methodology, you change your aqidah. And may Allah protect us from that. And Anything I said that was correct is from Allah Azza wa Jalla. Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the Shaitan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.